everybody. I am off on sabbatical with Cindy, having a great time, I'm sure. But I wanna welcome Ben, Calvary Chapel Lubbock, one of my main guys. He's gonna kick this off tonight on Wednesday night. So uh, would you welcome Ben Martinez as he comes and opens the word for you guys. Yes? yes. All right, all right, all right. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to be with you. I am so honored and humbled. I get to share with you what God's been putting on my heart. And, and I'm so grateful for your pastor. Aren't, aren't you grateful, Amen. Pastor Bill? I mean, we love him and we love Pastor Bill and Cindy. And of course, I love y'all. And uh, if, if I wasn't pastoring Calvary Chapel Lubbock, I'd probably be at this church. So just so you know, just so you know, you're like my second home. Would you agree with that? All right, all right, all right. So how many people follow me on Facebook? Anyone? All right, well, if you didn't, you should, because I told you to invite some friends. So uh, we're going to see what God's going to do. So if you have your Bibles, let me see your Bibles tonight, guys. Let me see them. Ooh, that's awesome. If you have them, let's, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. And I hope you love me after this message. But I think it's what God wants for y'all. Acts chapter 27. Um, Pastor Bill called me earlier. Um, I was visiting uh, in the hospital. There was a there's a older older girl that uh, lady. Uh, bless her heart. Her name is Diana Ramirez, and she used to come to Calvary Chapel Lubbock. She's since moved to uh, Amarillo, and um, she's in the hospital. And I was told today that they were probably going to send her home in hospice. And so I would ask that you play for Diana Ramirez. And um, she, we, it was beautiful. Well, in the meantime, I'm praying for her. Pastor Bill calls and, he's, and he just wanted me to tell you that he loves you guys. He said, tell him I love him. And I said, I will. I'll tell him. So you, you're my witnesses, right? I told you. I told you. I told you. So, um, pray for Diana, we're, we're going to lift her up, and, uh, and so tonight we're going to look at Acts chapter 20. Anybody excited? Yeah? All right, good. Did you invite some folks? Yes. <laughs> Three people, amen. You're like, yes, not me. Okay, well, that's okay, because we're going to get into God's word. I do have a, a good friend of mine, an assistant pastor. His name is Santos. He's sitting right over here. And uh, I love to tease him because his name means saints. And so it's like, saints came with me. And when he was walking in, I said, oh, when the saints go marching in. And so <laughs> anyway, so uh, I hope he takes me home after this. <laughs> he, he may not. He may get up and leave. But anyways, um, yeah, he's assistant pastor. And so we love you guys. We love you. Um, don't forget, guys, we're going to break down tonight verses 9 through 20. Now, I know Pastor Bill teaches you guys so well. And so I'm not going to necessarily expose the scripture. I'm just going to kind of give you an overview and just kind of pull out some application that I think um, that God has for us. So, um, but uh, we are going to break that down. Now, if you're taking notes, right, you remember if you need to take notes, why? Because you get extra credit in heaven if you take notes. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm telling you, somebody's going to ask for your notes. Did you take notes at Grace? Uh uh-huh. All right. You get no pool in your mansion. That's why I'm telling you right now. Uh, If you're taking notes, I'm calling this message, guys, the shipwrecked life. The shipwrecked life. Now, uh, before we pray, can we jump and we jump into our text? Can we welcome our listening audience and those watching by the internet? Amen. Woo! Come on, guys. All right. All right. So. Normally, what Pastor Bill does, he has you stand. I'm not going to do that because it'll, it'll be a little bit before we get in the text, but just give me a good amen if you're in Acts 27. Amen. Okay. Well, everybody's there. Amen. Wow. All right. I don't know what to do next. So. <laughs> Usually, I wait. He's like, is it been there? Let's pray, guys. Um, Nathalie, my wife, sends her love to y'all. She wanted to be here, um, but I made her stay home. I said, No. These are my friends, but no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm, I'm kidding. I am so kidding. I am so going to be in trouble. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. Uh, you guys ready? Let's pray. 
So Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for Wednesday night at Grace Church. I thank you, God, for what you're going to do. I thank you for the people that came. I thank you that, Lord, they're here, they're hungry, but they need a touch from you. Lord, all week long, we've, we've been struggling, and we've been fighting, and we've been, uh, Lord, we just need to hear from you. And my prayer tonight, Lord, is that if there's anyone here tonight that you brought that doesn't know you, hasn't committed, oh, they come to church, but, but Lord, they're not, they're not part of the family yet. I pray that through this message, your Holy Spirit would move. Lord, it's not me, it's you. And so I thank you, and I pray right now, those of us, Lord, that you would open up our heart, and Lord, help us to hear your spirit and your teach, and I pray that I wouldn't speak anything, Lord. I wouldn't speak anything that you don't want me to, but God, you would speak. So Lord, we just give you this night. We thank you. What a blessing, what an honor, Lord. May your spirit fill. We ask that the Holy Spirit would fall on this place like never before. So God, that we could, so that we could hear you. Lord, we love you. It's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't know if you know this, but I was, uh, I was here just a few months ago, not teaching. Nathalie and I were here in Amarillo, and we came down in March to do a wedding. Where's Owen? Where's Owen and Jennifer? Where are they? I don't see them. Where'd they go? Oh, they're way over there. Okay, well, there they are. We came down. You remember? And uh, I, I got to officiate, and so, guys, we came down on Friday, and, and we had planned to do the rehearsal, and we were getting ready. They were getting ready for the big day. I was just doing what I do, and while we were all rehearsing, right, like where should you stand and who should do what and so forth, we got, I don't know if you remember this, we got a weather alert, right? A huge thunderstorm and a tornado was on the ground headed right for us. And we're sitting in this metal building, and we're like, no, oh, it's okay, right? It's, it's, so we're just like, no, this is not the safest place for us. So we decided to leave. Okay, rehearsal's over. Let's go. We got to get out of here. You're going to go eat. We're not going to go eat. We're going to get out of here. Are you kidding me? And so we didn't seem safe for us, so we decided. Now, if you recall, Pastor Bill's father had just passed, and we were headed to the celebration of life service. Except as we drove off, everything became dark. And it was just like, um, there was rain, and there was wind, and you could see power outages, and I'm like, and I'm thinking, listen, our, our hotel was just a couple of miles from the venue, that's all it was. It was just a couple of miles, as well as Pastor Bill's dad's service. And we're just like, and there's a tornado, right? There's a tornado, and, and here's the problem. The problem was going back to the hotel was in the direction of the tornado. And so we're just like, and, and, and Nathalie was really scared. I wasn't, you know, I was, I was all right. <laughs> I was, Nathalie was really scared. I mean, she really was. She, <laughs> she was scared, and uh, she kept asking me, why are you driving towards the tornado? Why, why are you driving? And I asked her, well, where else would you like to go? And she said, away from the tornado. <laughs> well, I said, well, that's Lubbock. And she said, I know, that's fine. Let's go to Lubbock. <laughs> and this storm really scared her, just so you know. Well, we made it to the service. Do you guys remember that? It was much safer because it was a brick building, and eventually this passed, and I remember going back to the hotel, and I was like, wow, that was crazy. That was crazy. My wife is like, hey, why are you driving to the tornado? And I'm like, I don't know where to go, and it was crazy. It's a huge storm here. And then, a couple months later, I'm watching Pastor Bill online. Yes, I watch Pastor Bill from time to time, okay, just so you know. And it was June 1st, right? And I was listening to Pastor Bill, and, and basically what he said, there was a huge storm that again passed through Amarillo. This was even crazier. Pastor Bill said, and he's sitting up here and he's going, and, I'm, and I went from my iPad to my computer, and, I'm, and he's going back to divorce, and here's what really freaked me out as I watched him. He said it went from blue to green to red, to dark purple, how many of you remember that? And he's like, thank God we still have a building. And I'm like, man, that's just crazy. He said there were up to 80 mile an hour winds headed toward his house in this church. And I was like, thank God I live in Lubbock. <laughs> we don't have any winds there. Just kidding, we do, just kidding. 
So those of you who live in Amarillo and surrounding areas, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You know the huge storms that come through here. You guys know this. We're all buckling down. We're all getting crazy. I mean, it was crazy. Can I get an amen? And you go, Pastor Ben, yes. Why are you telling us this? Well, I tell you these stories because I believe it illustrates what the Apostle Paul experienced when he traveled to Rome by ship. You see, Paul, like you all, Oh, you like that, right? Paul, like you all, was quite aware of the storms on the sea. But let me just say this. And the storms in life. And the storms in life. So this evening, what I'd like to do with your permission is talk to you a little bit about storms. Not, not the kind where you go, Pastor, I got 80 mile an hour winds and I have to. I have to but, but I want to talk to you about the storms of life. Storms that really affect us. In other words, I want to talk to you about where do you run, church, when life gets really messy or life gets super hard? When you feel like life hits you with rain and it's coming sideways and, and, and clouds and there's darkness in your life. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's just that darkness. You go, how's it going? I don't know. I just feel this darkness. And, 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 and in your life, you could say there are 80 a mile an hour winds. That's how I feel. And then you ask the question, what should I do? What should I do? Well, tonight, I want to give you a word of encouragement. I want to give you a word of hope. You see, I began to pray about this teaching. I got a call from Mary. Mary said, hey, Pastor Ben, Pastor Bill wants you to come up and preach. Would you mind doing that? Oh, of course not. I don't mind. I love this church. And I began to pray, Lord, what do you have for them? What do you really have for them? And so I began to just think and I began to pray. And I really was just seeking and I found myself in Acts chapter 27. And as I meditated on these verses, I began to see a pattern, listen to me, of things people will cling on to or actually abandon when life gets shipwrecked. Meaning when life gets difficult. When life gets difficult. So this evening, in the time that we have, I want to share some insights from the Word of God on how Jesus is the only one we should cling to no matter what life gives us. Pastor, explain. How many of you ever heard that saying, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade? How many of you heard that, right? We've all, we've all heard that. Well, here's my prayer. My prayer is when life hands you lemons, run to Jesus, give him your lemons, and let him make whatever he wants to make out of them. That's what we should be doing. But I am well aware that in a, in a, in a service like this, there are people here who are not walking with Jesus, there are people here who have been invited by other. Hey, come with me to your, we got we got dinner. Dinner's on me. It's only three bucks. No problem. We'll just come on. Well, we'll, we'll and, and I understand that you've invited friends, and I understand. I understand we're listening. It's it's live on the radio, and I understand we're on the internet. But I get it, guys. I get it. I get it. You're sitting here going, man. I, what do you mean make lemons out of lemon? What? Do you, but, but but I want to show you something in the text that I believe that God wants to do something in our lives. So what I want to do is let me give you some background. I think background is important because you need to know what's going on. The Apostle Paul, if you recall, is imprisoned at Caesarea by the sea. He appeals to Festus, okay? Not the guy from Gunsmoke, but Festus. I just want to, I lost half of you. I know that. Anybody 40 and under is like, what's a gun smoke? But anyways, that's, I get it. <laughs> and that just shows my age, doesn't it? I just threw, yeah, amen. See, she's like, amen. That was code for you're old. But anyways, here's, here's the deal. He appeals to Festus, and in his case, he's to be heard in Rome before Caesar. So Paul is now being sent to Rome to stand trial. That's where he's going to go. So Acts 27 gives us the voyage Paul makes from Caesarea over to Rome. Everybody with me? And it actually starts in verse 4, but uh, I'm not going to go there. Now, here's what I want you to see. Paul set sail from Rome. Everybody got that? Give me an amen if you got that. Okay? And this is a tale. It's a tale of a faithful trip that started from this trumpet port aboard this tiny ship. 
Now, hold on, keep in mind, the weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. <laughs> I really don't know if, this, if the ship that Paul was in called the minnow, I, it's not important. But in verses four through eight, they explain the first part of the journey to Rome. It provides really little information about the storm and the ultimate shipwreck. So tonight, for the sake of time, we're going to pick it up in verse 9, okay? We're going to pick up our study in verse 9. So go with me in verse 9, and it says this, Acts chapter 7, verse 9, it says, Now, when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was over, Paul advised them, verse 10, saying, Men, I perceive this voyage will end in disaster and much loss, not only the cargo in the ship, but also our lives. Now, your attention, please. Paul is warning the prisoners. Now, catch this. He isn't speaking right here as a prophet of God, but he's speaking as someone who lived in Amarillo and has gone through the storms. He's, he goes, I know what it's like to be out in the sea. It's like asking you, how long you lived in Amarillo? Well, I lived in here 75 years. Well, you know what storms are like. I mean, you, that's, that's what he's saying right here, guys. And he's an experienced traveler on the waters of the Mediterranean. Paul logged some 3,500 miles by the sea. In his experience as a traveler, Paul says, guys, let's not go on. Let's not go on. This is not good. <laughs> this is, this is going to end bad for us. This is going to end bad for us. In addition, I'd like to point out to you that Paul had already been in three shipwrecks. So he's like, oh, you boy, not another one. Guys, please, please. Man, so he knew what the stormy seas were like. Second Corinthians chapter 11, 25 tells us. So, so you guys with me, he says, man, guys, listen, listen. I perceive this is not going to be good. You all with me? Verse 11, he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things that, that was spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest to winter there. Now, check this out. You have a centurion. He says the centurion. You go, okay, when, who, who's that then? The centurion is the overseer of a hundred men, okay? He's in charge of Paul, getting Paul and the others to Rome. He's the centurion. You with me? Then you have the captain and then the owner of the ship. All these guys are going, okay? You go, well, break it down for me, Ben. Well, you have Captain Steubing and the owner of the princess decide that it's far better to sail on to Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, which is about 30 or 40 miles, okay? So Captain Steubing says, now let's go. Let's go forward. Let's go forward, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Now, here's what I want to point out. I want to point out a couple of things before we get even deeper. I want to point out some things that could, in fact, change your life tonight. In that verse, Ben, what is it? Now, I realize that on a Wednesday night at Grace Church, I'm preaching to the choir. Okay? I'm preaching. But I still want to bring out something, okay? I still want to, you know, because here's what I'm thinking. Maybe you're here tonight... And you haven't really fully committed their, your life to Jesus. You're attending church. You're interested in the things of God, but you've never really fully committed. And so I found some reasons maybe why in this text. I found them in verse 11 and verse 12. You go, what are they? One of the reasons, guys, that people don't fully commit their lives to Jesus, let me say it in just a simple way, that they're not saved, they're not born again, is really simple. If you're taking note, you can write this down. You go, what is it? Number one, the persuasive words of men. The persuasive words of men. You go, what do you mean? Notice it says, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than the things spoken by Paul. You go, pastor, how does that work in my life? 
In other words, the reason a lot of us have not given our lives to the Lord or whatever it might be is because we are listening to man more than to the word of God. We're persuaded by other people. We're persuaded by man. We're persuaded instead of looking in the word of God and going, oh, okay, these are the things of the Lord. And that's one of the main reasons, guys, that a, that a, a soul can get shipwrecked because, again, we're listening to persuasive words of men instead of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You're hearing what people are saying at work. You're hearing what other people are, oh, yeah, well, you know, that Christianity, you've heard this, it's a crutch. And you know what I say? It's not a crutch. You know what? It's an ambulance. I need an ambulance. Right? But we're listening to that, and so that keeps us from coming to the fullness of Jesus. That's one reason. I was like, wow. You go, Ben, give me another reason. You ready? Number two. Following the powerful influence of our peers. What do you, where, where, where do you see that? Notice it says, the majority advised to set sail. What? Think about it, guys. There are a lot of people who haven't committed their lives to the Lord Jesus because they're under the influence of what our friends might think. It's powerful. It's powerful. A little 11 year old girl at our church is getting baptized this Sunday. And she told her mama, I don't like to talk about God. And her mama said, why, sweetie? What, what's going on? Well, people are mean to me when I talk about God. People, my, my friends are mean to me. And I think a lot of reasons that people, one of the reasons, guys, that people don't come, they don't make that commitment. Now, now here, here's the thing. Listen to me. At the end of our study, I'm going to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus. You guys know me by now. And, and, and what I have you do is I'll have you do something extremely brave. I have you come forward and I have you stand right here. Well, Pastor Bill doesn't do that. I know he doesn't. But here's what I'd love for you. That you would have a defining moment that you could say to the Lord. I remember going in this church, this day, this time, giving my life to the Lord. The problem people don't do that, church, listen to me, is found in the scriptures, right? Because we're listening. What are we doing? Because we're listening to the powerful influence of what other people are saying. Man, I'm going to lose friends. Listen, if I, if I, Ben, listen, I, I like listening to you. You're pretty funny. I mean, it's cool. But listen, if I give my life to Jesus, I mean, I'm going to lose. Listen, my friends are not going to ask me to go out Friday night. We're not going to be able to hang. We're not going to be able to kick it. Listen, I'm just going to, no, oh, see, see, listen, I like that other style of Christianity. The style where I can do things and have fun and not so radical. Y'all got quiet on me. You with me? Oh, that's, a, that's a good reason. It's powerful. It's powerful. Think about it. Back in our text. We'll keep going. Back in our text. Verse 13 is pretty far. If you're an underliner or highlighter, go ahead and look at this. You go, why? Because it says, as Dr. Luke is writing in Acts 27, 13, he says, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close to Crete. Now, to you and I, we go, Verse 13. <laughs> I don't, okay. Listen, listen. What Paul is saying, I mean, yeah, what, what, what Luke is writing here, he says, everything seems to be going as planned. It looks like it's smooth sailing. Smooth sailing. Do you see that? Do you see that? Turn to your neighbor and say, smooth sailing. Now turn to the neighbor you ignored and say, smooth sailing. Shame on you. May I, may I give you a reason, another reason many have not committed their lives to Jesus? It's number three. Presumptuous desires of the world. You go, Pastor, I'm not sure what you mean. They look around and they sit here and they go, listen, Ben, things are going well. Things are going well. I don't need Jesus. What do you mean you don't need? It's smooth sailing, man. 
Because my life is good. I got the girl that I love. I got money in the bank. Got a great job. It's all good, bro. And it's the presumption. You guys see that in verse 13? Do you see it? Man, Paul, listen, we're going to set sail. Man, listen, things aren't going to be good. No, no, no. When the south wind blew, oh, the south wind blew. The problem is, guys, in a short time, the ship and everyone on board will get caught in a storm and they send this ship to the bottom. To the bottom. A lot of people, guys, will put off coming to know Jesus because they go, man, things are good. Things are good. I've worked hard. Things are good. Things are good. You need Jesus to save you. No, I'm good. I'm good. Keep that in mind because I'm going to show you something later on in the scriptures that will pull this back out. So here we go. Verse 14. But not long... But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called a Euroclidon. A Euroclidon, right? Right? I think Landry needs to, to write a song on, with Euroclidon in it, don't you think? Uh, it's just a cool word. It's like the Euroclidon, right? So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, notice what it says. Help me, church. We let her drive. Everybody see that? And running under the shelter of the island called Claudia, we secured the skiff with difficulty. Now, again, Paul, Dr. Luke, I mean, just, he's like, just give it to me in English. Okay, let me say, here's where things start taking a turn for the worse. Luke writes, it wasn't long when we were in the storm of our lives. And this thing was called a Euroclidon. Now you go, Ben, what is that? What's a Euroclidon? Okay, well, here's what we got to get the gist of it. A Euroclidon is a very strong, very cold wind. Sometimes it approaches hurricane force. You have waves as high as 12 to 25 feet. This is what's going on in the Mediterranean. And Luke says, oh my goodness, we are caught in the hurricane. We are caught in this typhoon. And here, notice what he says. He says, we let her drive. In other words, you know what he said? He said, we let go of the wheel. We just, here's the thing, right? You guys see me? Here's the wheel. And there's like, we just let go of the wheel. We just, we, it was so intense. It was so mind blowing. He says, we let go. And then we were tossed to and fro. He said, and we actually moved us 25 miles to the south. What? And the, all, the, all the prisoners were singing, Jesus, take the wheel, take it from my... No, they weren't singing that. I'm kidding. But, but he let go of the wheel, right? And I would, that's what I would be singing. I'd be like, Jesus, take the wheel, because we're, we're going to die. We're, 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 we're going to die. One of our thoughts he says, was to secure the lifeboats. And the last thing we needed to do was be tossed and cause more damage just in case. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, it was super hard, but we finally did it. We finally did it. Now stay with me. Note verse 17. And when they had taken it on board, this is the lifeboat, they used cables to undergird the ship. Everybody see that? And fearing lest they should run aground to Sirtis, Sands, they struck sail and so were driven. Okay, lots of things are happening right here. Lots of things, okay? What happened? Number one, they got the lifeboat on board, okay? Because that's important. Got to have a lifeboat. Got to have a lifeboat. But notice what they said. Something very interesting. It says the Bible, the word of God says they use cables or ropes to undergird the ship. Everybody see that? We have no idea what that means. We're like undergird. Unless you're a sailor in Amarillo, Texas, we don't know what that means. So let me share this with you. You go, what does it mean, Ben? What does it mean? This undergirding means that it was done by passing ropes under the ship. Okay. So I wonder who that dude was. Hey, who's going to dive in the water and take this rope underneath? Santos, we'll just pick him, right? <laughs> Owen, let's pick Owen. He's not doing anything later. That's, but, but 
You see what I'm saying? And so they would go under the ship and they would fasten the ends together, holding the sides of the ship tight so that it wouldn't break apart. That was a pretty good plan. Let's, let's, let's tighten everything up. Let's get some ropes, tighten everything up. You're like, okay, cool. Another fear, while all this is going on, they, they, there's a fear that they get stuck in the sands, right? The Surta Sands. They were the infamous graveyard of the ships off the, north, off the coast of North Africa. It was kind of like the Bermuda Triangle. At all costs, sailors said, we want to avoid that area, please. So you've got a lot of things going on. A lot of things, okay? They're trying to gird their ship. Everybody with me? They're trying to tighten things down. They're in the storm of their life. They're in a Euroclidon. This is crazy. Notice the next three verses, guys. We're going to read them, and then we'll come back, and we'll do some work. And it says in verse 18, And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, when neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days, no small tempest beat on us. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Wah, wah, wah. Those are sad verses. Those are sad verses. Now, church, let's, Matt, let's, let's, let's wrap our mind around what's happening here. Put yourself in their sailor suits. They're super scared. They're fearing for their lives. Each one of them, they were certain they were going to die. You guys with me? They're certain they're going to die. So in panic mode, what did they do? The word of God says they did. Jot this down, guys. They lightened the ship. First, first and foremost, they're, they, they're undergirding the ship. We got that. They're undergirding. They, they tie it down, and then they're like, oh, no, we got to do something else. So they start lightening the ship. You go, Ben, what did they throw overboard? Right? What did they throw overboard? Guys, they threw their, their food supply overboard, the wheat and everything they were going to eat. They threw that overboard. Like, we got to lighten the ship. In an effort to be saved, they threw over the very source of strength they would need if they survived. You're like, oh, okay. Well, then what happened? Then, if that wasn't enough, on the third day, guess what? They threw everything else overboard. What was that? Tackle, furniture, right? They're casting out merchandise, the tackle that was in it, and the ship. You know, they wanted to what, guys? They wanted to make the ship a lot lighter. And I got to tell you, I'm very thankful I wasn't on that ship. They would have thrown me overboard, too. <laughs> How much do you weigh? None of your business. <laughs> right? I mean, I would <laughs> I'd be looking, I'd be like, oh, that, dude, that dude's really big. Hey, dude, hey, you got to go, bro. <laughs> but they didn't throw anybody overboard. They didn't throw anybody overboard. Well, it makes things worse. It makes things worse. They had a cold wind, rain, they were probably seasick because the Bible says they were tossed to and fro in this tempest. They were tossed up and down. They were hungry. Why were they hungry? Because they threw their food overboard. And then they were tired. Why? Because the ropes and the tackle of being thrown overboard. They haven't seen, they haven't seen the sun or the stars for many days, you know what that does, church? It makes it impossible to determine their position. In other words, they're lost. Have you ever been there? Maybe you've been in a storm in your life where you go, man, I don't even know where I'm at. I am so struggling, Ben. I don't even know where I'm at. I don't know which way is up, Ben. I just, you don't understand. My life is just a mess. And, and I haven't seen the sun, even though the sun's up. I haven't seen stars. I just, see, we can get that way, guys, in our lives. We can get that way. And they have no idea where they are. 
we had a young lady come in our office Sunday morning, and, and, and her quote to me was, I don't even know how I got here. Not physically at the church, but everything that she was dealing with. I don't even know how I got here. How did I get here? How did I get here? And if that wasn't enough, look at the verse, last part of verse 20. It says, they lost all hope. They lost all hope to be saved. And they finally gave up. Now let's chat for just a moment, church. Let's chat. As I was praying and meditating, I said, Lord, this is, I, 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 I understand in the context, it was Paul in a real ship, in a real storm, and, and I understand all of verse 27, but I said, Lord, how, how can we apply that? How can, we, how can we use that, Lord, in our lives? And he began to show me. He began to show me. And I began to see the ship, it, it sort of symbolizes, if you will, symbolizes a lot of lives. You go like, well, how so, Pastor. Well, I believe people's lives that have been through some major storms. So labor with me, church, for just a moment, because I want to make some observations, okay? And I do, I want to reiterate, guys, simply applying the ship as a symbol of our life. Because so many people face adversity in their lives. So many people. And many of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. Many of you have faced the storms of hard economic times. You know what I'm talking about. Just when you felt you got your head above water economically, you got the pink slip. At the, at, at, hey, we don't need you anymore. Just when you thought, man, I got that bill paid off. An unexpected bill comes in the mail. You're just like, what? I can't get ahead. So we know that storm. Can I get an amen? amen. We know the storm, guys, of, of sickness. We know the storm. Oh, I'm not, not. <laughs> I have a cold. I'm okay. We know the storms of sickness. And I'll never forget. It was four years ago that I sat in a doctor's office where they told us my wife had breast cancer. And I remember sitting there, and the, and, and the doctor looks at me and goes, you're a minister, you know what this means. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? And I could feel the Euroclidon climbing. What are we going to do? You go, why, Pastor Ben? Why was, I mean, listen, people get, people get sick every day. Why, 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 why did you freak out? Why? Here's why. Because some of you don't know this about me, but my mom when I was 18 months old, only just a baby, she died of breast cancer. And then when I turned 13, my sister, who was just a few years older, at 18, 19, she dies of lung cancer. So I'm sitting in the doctor's office in 2015, and they say, sir, your wife has breast cancer. I could feel, you guys know what I'm talking about? You know, that, that is real, that was a storm. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I know. I know exactly the storm of what's going on, of sickness, and even death. I get it. Many of us have faced again, other trials in your life. Other trials. And here's what I want you to see. People do the same things in life that these sailors did to survive. Yo, Pastor, what are you talking about? Like what? Everybody say, like what? Like what? Well, jot this down. In the same way, they try to sustain themselves in the midst of a storm. In the same way they try to sustain themselves, that's what we do. Say, how so? Okay, let's try again. How so? There you go. Just want to make sure you're awake. If you're taking note, you can jot this down. You know how they do it? They do it with ropes. With ropes? Yeah. Can I give you four ropes we use to try to sustain our lives when we're in the midst of a storm? You go, what's that? Jot this down. It's the rope of religious activity. 
It's the rope of religious activity. See, not Jesus, but religion. Pastor Santos and I were driving up here and we were actually talking about this, but we were talking how a lot of people know about God. Do you remember Paul before, Saul before he got saved? He knew a lot about God, but he didn't know God, did he? It wasn't until Acts chapter 9 where he got saved on the road to Damascus. We were talking about this, and I thought that's exactly what we do. See, Paul had the rope of religious activity. That's what a lot of people do. They're in the midst of a storm in their life, and what they do is they go, okay, here's what I need to do. I need to somehow, I need to make some, some, some wrong, I need to make it right. I know I'll go to church. I know I'll be good. I'll somehow appease, appease this God by my religious activities. And maybe if I can get in God's good graces, the storm will stop and everything will be all right. That's, they're trying to secure the ship, right? Your life is just falling apart. And you go, okay, got to go to church. But we know a lot about God, but we don't know Jesus. You go, give me another rope, pastor. Okay, maybe it's not the rope of religion, but here, what if it's the rope of worldly counseling? You go, pastor, I'm not sure what you mean. Whenever I'm in a storm, guys, there are times that we seek advice from people who are not in tune with Jesus. It's worldly, right? And sometimes you'll get even this quote. Hey, man, you're in a mess. I'm in a mess. You're in a storm. I'm in a storm. Man, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Right? Worldly counseling, mean, meaning you need to improve your situation by your own efforts. It's the rope of what? Worldly counsel. I gotta secure my life. I gotta secure my life. You go, what else? Give me another one, Ben. Well, here's this. It's the rope of fight or flight. The rope of fight or flight, right? When it fight, here's what we do. When we use this rope, we will attack everything and we will fight battles that are not even ours. We will pour our effort into everybody else's battle. And that's what we do. If I'm in the midst of a storm, let me just... And, and it happens in our homes and it happens in our, right, in our, in our families and we have things going on in our extended families and oh, why are you in the midst of this? I've just got to do something. I've got to say something and, and we'll fight or we'll flight. Now this is, this is what a lot of people do. Come on, stay with me, church. We'll flight. You go, what do you mean? We'll simply check out or shut down. When we're in the midst and we're using this road, here's what we'll do. We'll get numb and we'll get apathetic. What do you do? I don't care. What's going on? We'll shut down. I'm not talking. I'm not talking. And we use that rope when there's a storm in our life. When it's going from blue to red to dark purple. Man, let's use the storm. Let's use the storm. Let's, let's, uh, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Hey, you want to go to church? I don't want to go to church. I'm okay. I'm okay. Let me give you the fourth rope. How many of you would agree with me we have the rope of busyness? The rope of busyness. You go, what do you mean? In order to sustain our lives in a storm, we just, get often, we just often get super busy. We just get super busy. Why? Because, guys, we run away. We run from one thing to another to another. We're busy. We're busy. And the reason I found is because if you stop for five minutes, then you'll have to deal with the storm. And so people get super busy. Guys, you can see this in, in kids. Whenever you have kids that are just and you know their home life isn't good, they are not going to stop because the moment they stop, they'll have to deal with their life as a mess at home. We do that same thing. We do the same. Busy. I'm busy. How you doing? I'm good. Busy, man. Busy. How you doing? You want to get a coat? No, I'm busy. I got stuff to do. I'm busy. You know, we get, and, and, and we use this rope, right? This is what we do. This is what we do. The problem is, without Jesus, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what did they do? Well, they tried all of this, but remember what they did next? They went from sustaining. I've got to sustain this. Now the storm's getting worse, so they go to survival mode. Survival, right? What did they do? They started throwing cargo overboard, right? They tried to lighten the ship. They were not thinking, let's just sustain, let's just, let's just ride this thing out. You know what they did? We're in survival mode. 
we're going to die. We are in survival mode. So let's wrap our minds around what's happening as the storm intensifies. Let's wrap our mind about that. When, when I was doing Owen and Jennifer's wedding, it, it was just an alert. But by the time we got in our car, by the time we took it serious, everything was getting dark. It was rainy. The storm was intensifying. And that's, you go, well, what did they do? Well, as they began fearing for their lives, we are certain that things are going to get worse. So in panic mode, we actually do the same thing. Like what, Pastor? Well, we've moved from sustaining the storm in our life to now survival. What do we do in survival mode? We'll often abandon precious cargo. Well, like what? Help me, guys. Like what? The first thing we abandon, if we're honest, is godly relationships. In survival mode, oftentimes, guys, we will abandon those who are very close to us. You go, why? Because our greatest fear is they won't understand. And the second greatest fear, guys, is that they might judge our Christianity. Well, I thought you were a better Christian than that. I thought, what are you doing? And so we'll abandon godly relationships. And what happens, guys, is that you're in the midst of, you're in the midst of a storm, and you'll get a phone call from a godly friend just checking on you, and you'll let it go to voicemail. Because... God forbid Christians go through a storm. Well, she'll never understand. He'll never understand. Should I call him back? No, I'm okay. Well, the storm intensifies, church, and the second thing we abandon, guys, is our belief system. We throw that out. You go, what do you mean? Well, a belief system is consisting of an interrelated items of assumptions, beliefs, or ideas, and knowledge of an individual holds about anything concrete. So that's your belief system. It comprises an individual's worldview and determines how he or she abstracts, filters, structures information he receives from the world around them. So what do you do? Man, storm is intensifying. I've already tried all the ropes, not working. I've abandoned godly relationships, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start to doubt our own belief system. There's a few couple of phrases that I've used, maybe you haven't, but I've used over my lifetime that has determined that I've abandoned right, my belief system. God, if you love me, you won't let this happen. Right? That, that's my, my belief system. I know God loves me. That's my belief. That's in my DNA. But I'll use that. If God, if you're really good, then why am I in, I am, why am I in this storm? And, and we'll abandon that, guys. We'll abandon that. We'll just be like, hey, Okay, Sarah, Sarah, it is what it is, right? We'll, we'll abandon that because we're in panic mode. We're in panic mode. What's the third one? And this is the worst one of all, guys, because then we abandon hope. We abandon hope. Life seems so dark. It says no end in sight, and all hope is lost. See, hope, church, listen, hope is the life force that keeps us going and gives us something to live for. I can live without food for about half a day. No, I'm just kidding. I can live without food, right? We can live without water for a little bit. We can actually live without air for a little bit. But you know what we can't live without? Hope. And, and again, that's what we abandon. 
Hope is a crucial part, guys. Listen to me. Hope is a crucial part of dealing with life's problems and maintaining resilience is a face as we face the obstacles. That's, that's how we are. And even a glimmer of hope that our situation will turn around can keep us going. Pastor, what do you mean? If there was a storm headed towards Amarillo, when we keep watching, whether it's our iPad or our, or our computer or who's ever on the TV, if it looks like it's heading up north, that's a glimmer of hope. It's not going to hit us. All right. And, and, and again, what do we do, guys? We'll abandon hope. And that's, that's where it gets dangerous. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is our hope. Where, where do we go from there? Where, 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 where do we go? Now, you're all looking at me, you're going, well, what should we do? What should we do? Well, if you happen to find yourself in a storm, you happen to find yourself in adversity, you you happen to be here tonight and you're in hard economic times, you've gone to the doctor, you are sick, you know someone who's sick, someone you love is sick, or you're facing just a trial in your life. Look at verse 22. Look what Paul says. Paul says, but take courage. Don't lose heart. None of you will lose your lives. I like the way the message says it. Let me read it to you in the message. He says, last night, or verse 23, sorry. He says, last night, God's angel stood at my side, the angel of this God I serve, saying to me, don't give up, Paul. You're gonna stand before Caesar yet. And everyone sailing with you is also going to make it. So what do you do? What do you hang on to? Where do you go when the storm in your life is trying to shipwreck you? Where do you go? When you've lost control or you've lost all hope, Guys, the strong anchor is God's presence, God's promises, and God's power. Pastor, what do I do? Guys, we need to run and cling to Jesus. His words are so comforting. He tells us in John chapter 14, verse 1, he says this to you and I. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be stressed out. Don't, it, it's okay, it's okay. It's gonna be all right. We have to run to Jesus. When Nathalie was diagnosed with cancer, all I had was Jesus. And I remember thinking, I remember thinking, Lord, what did I do? This is a huge storm. What did I do to deserve this? And I'm so glad God doesn't answer silly questions like that. He wasn't like, really? I mean, there'd be a list a mile long. You know what I'm talking about? But what happened, guys, I remember driving home from basketball practice, and I remember thinking thoughts like this. I could be driving home to an empty house. What if my wife's not there anymore? What am I going to do? All I had was Jesus. I'll never forget 
and some of you can relate to this, I'll never forget when my 17-year-old slash 18-year-old decided to leave house, to leave the house and move out of the city without telling us. She'd met a boy online. I'll never forget those storms of going, man, what do we do? What do we do? It's my baby. She's, I took everything in me not to get in that car, find her, and drag her home. All I had was Jesus. You see, the Bible tells us this, church. Listen to me. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. So if you're a Christian here tonight and you love Jesus, you know that there's going to be some rain in your life. So it falls either way. But what I want to do is I want to give you hope. A hope of Jesus tonight. The hope of a real and honest and true relationship with him. I want to close our Bible study tonight, guys. I want to close our Bible study with this, okay? As the worship team comes back up, listen, we have three types of people in the room. Three types of people. Let me give you the number one, okay? We have people in this room that are walking tight with Jesus. You are tight with the Lord. You had storms, and you're clinging to the Lord right now. You know what I'm talking about. That's you. To them, to y'all, I say, hang on. Keep moving forward. You're doing great. You're doing great. Don't look back. Keep moving forward. Jesus has got you. Another group of people, guys, we have in this room are those who might be in the middle of a huge storm. And tonight, you were tracking with everything I was saying. And you were nodding your head in agreement. Yep, Pastor, yep. But you needed this because life has just been super hard lately. Man, I needed this, Pastor. You won't believe this. And what you said is all I needed was that gentle reminder that Jesus has never left you. And he'll make it through. He'll make it through. You might be here very wet and very cold, very scared and very sick. And you might end up crawling, but you will make it to the other side. You're going to make it to the other side. And here his, is his promise for you. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you'll make it to the end. And then we have, we have those that have never They've never given their lives to Jesus. And I believe it's for the fourth. The fourth reason is simple. You go, what's that? The fourth reason is because of the punishing winds of life. You see, the Euroclidon of life has kept you from coming to the Lord Jesus. All the storms in your life have kept you from a complete surrender of your life to Him. And right now, as I'm speaking, you're thinking, yep, I remember that one. Yep, I remember that one. Yep, I remember. But listen, I've got good news today. Today is your day. Today is your day. The time is now. And if you're here tonight and you're going, Pastor, I am I'm tracking with you. I know exactly what you're saying. You know what I love? 
my Jesus followed you all the way to church tonight. And he's been sitting next, next to you going, all right, let's do this. Let's do this. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. An opportunity to what, Pastor? I'm going to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to you. You know, you know what it means to surrender, right? If I was going to go rob a bank, probably a bad analogy, forgive me. If I was going to go rob a bank, I would point a gun and this means surrender, right? We used to play that when you were little. Put your hands up. I surrender. The problem is, guys, is that there's a lot of us who know a lot about God, but we don't know Jesus. We don't know Jesus. There's a lot of us in this room that are going, oh man, oh man. Pastor, stop talking. My heart's beating fast. That's not me. That's God's Holy Spirit. Because in a minute, I'm going to ask you to do something incredibly brave. You go, what's that? I'm going to ask you, wherever you are in this room, I'm going to ask you, we're going to pray in just a moment, and then I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand if you want to receive Jesus. Pastor, I've already received Jesus. No, no, no. I'm not just saying receive him. I'm saying make a full-on commitment to God. Well, I don't have to be very brave to lift my hand. I'll lift my hand right now. No, 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 no. Listen, I'm going to pray for you. But the brave part is I want you to have a moment that's only yours. Where I ask you to get up out of your seat, come and stand right here. We'll lead you in a prayer. We'll have some prayer people up here that will pray with you and get you on the right track. Why do I want to do that? Now, now listen, listen. I know because of storms. I know because of storms. There's a, there's, there's, there might be somebody in here going, Pastor, I feel like I'm a million miles away from God. I feel like I'm oceans away from God. Listen, you may feel like that today, but you're only one decision away from coming back to him. And I want to say this to you. This is for somebody in here. Listen to me. God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And you've been feeling like God is mad at you and you tonight's your night. Or you need to come and you need to surrender and say, this is it. This is it. There are several in you, several in here that maybe needed to commit their, recommit their lives to God. You've, you've gave your life to the Lord. You know what it is to follow him and you've sort of backslid. The world looks real good. And tonight you're going, no, God, you brought me here for a reason. I, I, I just, I can't go this way anymore. I've done it my way. I don't want to do it my way. I want to do it your way. That's the gospel. The gospel. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. And brothers already started right here. Listen. This is your time. If you want Jesus, if you're ready, you just get up out of your seat, come and stand right here. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Amen. We'll clap for you. Heaven's going to rejoice. If you want Jesus, you come right now. Get up out of your seat as the worship team sings a song. Good move. Good move. Good move. Good move. Good move. I'm proud of you. Good move. Good move. Anyone else, anyone else saying, listen, I need to be up there. I need to be up there. You get up out of your seat. Come on. Come on now. This is your time. Come on. Good move, brother. Good move. Woo, I'm proud of you guys. Come on up here. Come on. Anyone else? Look at this. They're not, this, this is, we just went straight to the, straight to the invitation. That's how God's mighty, his mighty spirit moves. If you need to come, you come forward. You come forward. Good move. I'm proud of you. Yes. 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 Y'all sit there looking. You go, I need to be up there. I need to be up there. Get up. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Look at that. These are brave. Who else needs to be up here? Who else says, let's pastor, pray for me. I'm ready to commit my life to Jesus 100%. Well, it's a Wednesday night. Look at this. Who else? Who else? We're going to give you a moment and we're going to pray. I'm going to ask you, just come. Just come. Come just as you are. We'll pray for you. Let's 
just bow our heads and pray. You guys pray with me. I'm going to pray with you in just a moment, but let's, um, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace tonight. We thank you for your word. Lord, we love you. We're asking God that your spirit move mightily. And so, Lord, there are people all over this room that need to be up here. And we just pray, Lord. We just pray, God, that you would do a work. Even now, continue to do a work. Can you sing a chorus? And we'll wait. We'll wait. If you need to be up here, if your heart is pounding and you need to be up here, you know you need to be up here, please don't wait. This is your moment. And you made a prayer to prayer. There you go, brother. Amen. Amen. Okay. Can we do this, Grace? Can we do this? This isn't a golf clap. These people are going to go to heaven with us. Can we go this? Okay. We're just going to, just one more moment, guys, and then we're going to gather and pray. If there's anyone else, and again, I don't want to beat the point. This is between you and God's Holy Spirit. I don't, this is, this is a work of the Spirit. If there's anyone else right now that feels, I need to come forward, you got to do it now. You got to do it now. You're wrestling. You're wrestling. Your heart's beating fast. You prayed a prayer some time ago, but you go, man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. do this, guys. Those of you right here, why don't you move in and face me here, because I'm going to lead you in a prayer, okay? Come closer here. Again, we're going to do this, so if anybody else needs to get up here, come on closer over here, brother. We love you. Amen. I'm so proud of you. Come right behind here. Right behind here. Good move. Good move. Now, you guys realize what you're doing, right? You're surrendering your life to God. This is it, okay? This is your, this is it. You're saying, Lord, take it. Take it. I can't do this anymore. I need you. The only thing you have to do after this prayer is love Jesus. That's all you got to do. There's no rules. There's nothing you got to just love Jesus. He's going to direct you. He's going to take you where you need to be. I'm telling you. That's all you got to do is love Jesus. You go, what do I do? What do I do? Oh, there's got, you got to do one more thing. One more thing for me, right? After tonight, you can tell somebody, I got saved.